My phone rang, shattering the quiet of my apartment as I looked over the monitor of my computer at my brother Liam's face on the caller ID. I grabbed it, still ranging over my incomplete manuscript. I sat back in my chair. Hey Liam, what's on your mind? There was a long pause before a drawn breath. Avery, Uncle Silas died last night. I gripped the phone tighter. What do you mean? How? They found him this morning in the greenhouse. The police think he had a heart attack. Liam's voice sounded strained, like he was having trouble believing it. I thought of the times when I'd visited the greenhouse of my Uncle Silas when I was a child, smelling the earthy soil, glistening bright with various exotic flowers, and my uncle telling me various things about nature and the plants. It had been so many years since I'd seen the man that our interests had seemed to have drifted away from each other, mine in writing, and his in his botany research. Actually, Avery, there's something else, Liam said in a more serious tone. It's from my Uncle Silas's Will the Greenhouse. I blinked in surprise and looked again at the unpaid bills on my desk. Me? What do I have to do with him? I haven't set eyes on him in years. Not sure, but the lawyer said he wants you to take a look at it. Liam hesitated, concern creeping into his tone. Avery, I understand you're having difficulties with your authoring, but you really do need to check this place out. It's been neglected for some time. I glanced over at the picture of the young me and Uncle Silas in the greenhouse on my desk, both of us smiling for the camera. Nostalgia warred with unease in my chest. What had my uncle been keeping secret all this time? I shrugged. I'll head out there tomorrow. It owe it to him after all his help. Hey, Avery, be careful, Liam cautioned. All brother now. We don't know what Uncle Silas had going on here. It might be dangerous. I'll be okay, I said. I'll give you a call once I'm there. I sat there silently for a few moments after the call ended, staring at the photo in my hand. The greenhouse had always been a place of magic and mystery, a world within the world, a hidden place where my uncle had practiced his botanical wizardry. And now, it was mine. It was an odd inheritance, but it filled me with a mix of excitement and dread. I rose to my feet. I needed to grab some clothes and supplies and see if I could unlock the mystery of Uncle Silas's greenhouse. I stepped into the greenhouse and my chest filled with the familiar memories of my childhood and all the hours I had spent wandering through the different plants with my uncle. The air was thick with moisture, and the smell of the damp ground and the exotic plants filled my nostrils. The buzzing sound of the fans and the white noise of my footfalls on the concrete floor calmed me. I took a few steps further into the facility, noting that each table was covered with potted plants of some kind their leaves reflecting the sunlight streaming in from above. I reached out and traced my fingertips along the rough surface of the wood, and, oddly enough, the plants almost seemed to be reaching my way. I walked among the rows and spotted a strange flower. It had the appearance of tricolored flames on the petals. I thought of when Uncle Silas had taught me about hybridization and cross-pollination and how eyes had lit with the possibilities of botanical studies. With a flower in his hand, he said, Avery, we can create things by combining attributes of different species, invent entirely new things, unique things. I could hear the wonder and fear in his voice. But now, as I stood in the greenhouse by myself, I couldn't shake this feeling that there was something more, something that Uncle Silas hadn't told me about, hiding within his research. I could see the results of his handiwork in the plants around me, but I also had the sneaking suspicion that they carried secrets that should have been left well enough alone. I wandered around the building, thinking about my conversation with Liam. He was concerned for my well-being and had encouraged me to come to the greenhouse, take control. Since my writing difficulties had arisen, I'd felt a bit lost. But now, here, with this, and Uncle Silas's efforts laid out before me, I felt something return. Purpose. The unease that washed over me as I stepped inside the greenhouse made my spine tingle with it. The air within somehow grew more heavy with every footfall, and even the shadows in the corners seemed menacing. 
I thought about the concern in Dr. Evelyn Thorne's voice when I had talked about coming out here. Perhaps she had good reason. The strange illumination of the greenhouse as the sun set rivaled anything I'd ever seen before, and I knew it was time to go. But something tugged at my thoughts that told me this was really just the beginning of something new and very unexpected. I closed the door behind me and was back out into the cool evening, the key to the greenhouse weighing down in my pocket. I'd be back, I was sure. There was something in there that I wanted to see. In the meantime, I needed to keep working to solve this little mystery of Uncle Silas's, no matter what. I took a few more steps into the greenhouse and looked around at what Uncle Silas had been doing. Neat rows of plants, all neatly labeled and ordered, seemed to attest to his attention to the various tasks. I checked out some orchids that were on a table, petals of every hue and pattern imaginable. In the workspace were various hybridization charts and notes, and I could tell that my uncle had been engaging in some serious work. I looked over the papers, but could only appreciate the complex genetic schematics and the observations he'd meticulously recorded in his improbably neat penmanship. This was not just one of his hobbies. This was a biology out of most people's reach. Further inside the greenhouse, I spied another plant that drew my eye, and I stepped over to investigate. The leaves were a dark blue, and the flowers were iridescent and seemed to change colors with my movement. I moved closer and studied the transparent, glowing-veined petals intently, wondering what kind of exotic plant it must be. Without thought, I raised my hand to touch one of the iridescent blooms, and my eyes widened startledly when something whipped past me from within the foliage. I spun around, my heart hammering in my chest. The rows of vegetation lay ahead of me, leaves swaying softly in the greenhouse draft. I saw nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that moved from the corner of my eye. I laughed to myself and shook my head, dismissing my discomfort. It had been a shadow, or my mind playing tricks on me. When I turned back to the bright plant, I felt that the atmosphere had somehow changed. The air had grown heavy, and the sweet scent of the blooms too strong. I stepped back and scanned the greenhouse, the shadows in the aisles growing deeper and somehow more menacing. It was at that moment that I first became aware of its significance. That moment that I stood upon the wonders and the horrors that my uncle had dreamed of, but which had been unaccomplished by human hands. It was that of a plant, of an incredibly pulpy, tentacled thing, which lay rudely in a great ink-black pool of fused alchemist and phosphorescent, it was this thing that was shimmering far and inexplicably, and then crawling and flowing with great haste to wallow over the edge of the aperture and to the floor. Something waited for me in the greenhouse, amidst the verdant foliage and exotic blossoms. Dr. Silas Caldwell hadn't expected it, but I needed to make sure I honored my responsibilities and followed the path that had been laid before me. I was going to figure out what my uncle had been doing, Leaving the plant, I made my way back outside of the greenhouse, the sun setting and turning everything a warm, golden color outside. I knew as I left that parts of me would remain inside, attached to the mysteries my uncle had left for me here. The light of morning streamed in through the glass of the greenhouse roof, and I was seated at the old workbench with the stacks of notes and journals of my uncle, Dr. Silas Caldwell, before me. I could hear the rustling of the leaves and the sounds of the birds outside the open door as I pored over his work. I pored over the meticulous experimental notes, marveling at Uncle Silas's cleverness and his work with hybridizing the plants. Every entry described his determination to produce hybridized plants with adaptability and hardiness that seemed nearly impossible. I looked back up at the long rows of alien plants, each one a product of my uncle's genius for better or worse. Despite my unease, I found myself inexorably drawn to the greenhouse and the enigmatic plants within. I visited them more and more frequently, tending to their needs and learning as much as I could about the secrets my Uncle Silas had left in my hands. They were so beautiful, so brightly colored and intricate in their designs. The more time I spent with the plants, the more I began to get the feeling that something was wrong in the greenhouse. 
it was as if the air was charged, and I found myself looking over my shoulder once or twice, feeling like something was just out of my vision. Once or twice, I thought the plants were turned to something more than the light, watching me. I kept getting goose flesh on my arms and my spine was cold and tingling between my shoulders, and the air was hot and sticky. I tried not to dwell on it too much, chalking it up to an overactive imagination and the eeriness of the greenhouse. I mean, I had played here for hours on end when I was a kid, right? But as the days passed and the weeks stretched on, as I spent more and more time tending to the plants and maintaining my uncle's research, I could never shake that feeling of eyes on me. That morning, as I inspected some odd fern-like plant that seemed to shift and change colors in the light, I suddenly had the sensation of someone being behind me. I spun around, but there was no one there, only more rustling of leaves and the far-off sound of the ventilation. I took a deep breath in and out, trying to assuage my fears, but I couldn't shake the unease. I spun back around to the workbench and saw another journal entry that I had not noticed before. The words were hastily scrawled and were not as meticulously placed as the rest of Uncle Silas's neat handwriting. The words sentient and communication leapt off the page at me, and I felt a chill run down my spine. What the hell had my uncle discovered in his last days? What had he found out and not shared with anyone? I needed to find out. At any cost. The greenhouse, overflowing with vegetation, was the key. I had to learn what my uncle had been doing out here. I had to. I turned again to my research notes, and my mind was a whirl with it. The greenhouse felt like it stirred with life, and I knew I was on the cusp of some miraculous discovery. As I pored over the pages, the world outside of the greenhouse seemed to fade away, and I almost felt as if I could connect with the plants and the spirit of Dr. Silas Caldwell. The light from the late afternoon sun streamed in through the roof of the greenhouse, leaving long shadows on the leafy plants below. I was busy tending to them, trimming the overgrowth and watering. The air was rich and heady with the smell of the damp earth and the strange blooms, and it was refreshing in its familiarity. As I walked among the plants, I noticed a vine with deep green leaves and slender tendrils swaying gently and revealingly in the morning light. Curiously, I bent closer to get a better look, and was shocked when the vine's tendrils reached forward, toward me. I frowned and took a step back, questioning what I was witnessing. In my mind, I heard Liam's voice from our call, and the words of Dr. Evelyn Thorne, and I knew that the greenhouse was not a safe place to be. Still, I found myself drawn back to the vines. I circled the specimen, examining it, and as I moved, the tendrils of the vine moved as well, turning in my direction. It was almost as if the plant was conscious and reacting to my presence. In Uncle Silas's journal, I found his notations on the vine. He understood it to be some sort of genetic hybrid, considered and engineered. He'd noted that it had the potential for intelligence and adaptiveness, but had not been able to draw any other firm conclusions. I started setting up experiments to test the vine's capabilities. I placed lights, sound generators, and temperature regulators near the plant and observed the plant's reaction to them. I became more and more convinced that the vine was somehow sentient and reacting to its environment accordingly. In fact, as the sun set and the greenhouse filled with that orange light, I watched it. I leaned back and watched the vine moving. I found that this both excited me and made me a little more than nervous. I wondered what else the greenhouse was hiding and how far along Uncle Silas's experiments had brought plant sentience. I was a little excited and a lot nervous and thought I might just spend some more time researching my uncle's notes on it and see if I could determine anything else about how to take care of it and what it wanted. I felt like someone was watching me as I left the greenhouse and the way the vine tendrils seemed to follow my movements and steps it felt like there was something I was being reminded I didn't yet understand. I stopped at the entrance of the door, hand resting on the chilly metal handle. The air was damp against my skin, and I could hear the background hum of the ventilation system behind me. Turning my attention back to the rows of plants within, their leaves now dripping moisture, 
I could almost believe that the greenhouse was no longer just a display room, but an actual living presence that was somehow essential to my uncle's memory and legacy. I stepped out into the evening air, just starting to realize something amazing. Just starting to understand something about the greenhouse. I turned away and went to find Uncle Silas. The early light of morning streamed through the glass roof of the greenhouse as I bent over the workbench, peering through the microscope at my vine samples. The hours passed, and the first thing I knew of it was the fact that my back was starting to cramp from the hunched posture I'd been in most of the time I'd been crouched over the workbench. Around me, in a clearing around the bench, were piles of notes, drawings, and photographs, all detailing the behavior of the vine and its growth patterns. My phone buzzed and I frowned. The last thing I needed was this distraction. But when I saw all the missed calls and messages from friends and family, I had to ignore them. I was on the brink of some major revelations and couldn't afford to be sidetracked like this. The sound of footsteps approached from within the greenhouse interior, and I turned as Dr. Evelyn Thorne, a good friend of mine, entered the room and advanced towards me, a concerned expression on her face. I could see that she had already noted my disheveled appearance and the chaos of my workspace. Avery, she began with concern in her voice, I am worried about you. You spend too much time here alone. It is not healthy. I waved a hand at her and turned back to the microscope. It's nothing, Evelyn. I can't abandon this. I'm on the verge of a major breakthrough. Evelyn shook her head in exasperation. But what is the cost, Avery? To your health? To your relationships? Is it worth it? I was about to answer when I heard the footsteps approach again. Liam, my older brother, entered the greenhouse, his expression dubious and concerned. Avery, stop that, he said. It might not be healthy for us to focus so intently on Uncle Silas's work. We may not comprehend the dangers. It frustrated me that they didn't see the value in what I was doing or the potential discoveries. I shrugged. I can't just leave it. Avery. Liam shook his head with disappointment. You're losing your way, Avery. I turned away, back to the vine. The tendrils of it gestured, reacting to the tautness. I wondered at its rapid growth and development. Days stretched to weeks, and my isolation grew. The world outside grew more and more distant as my thoughts turned to the thick foliage surrounding me and the revelation they might provide. I became somewhat unkempt, and my once well-organized living space had become a jumble of books, papers, and discarded food containers, but it did not concern me. I was on the verge of an amazing discovery. The vine was rapidly growing and evolving, and increasingly more complex and intelligent as it did. I thought that if I could understand its secrets, I could make some significant advances in botanical and genetic studies, maybe even change the world. The unease began to crawl a little further up my spine as I read. I felt that the worries expressed to me by those friends and family were now not just concerns, but warnings of threats I didn't even know how to comprehend. Even so, I could not retreat. I was drawn to the greenhouse, drawn to what new discoveries might lay beyond. I was mad and driven, and nothing was going to keep me from exposing whatever secrets waited for me. I took a deep breath and faced the microscope again, looking forward to what it might reveal. The answers were there, waiting to be discovered, and I couldn't stop until I'd learned everything I could about the vine and its properties. I let the afternoon sunlight filter through the greenhouse roof above and play shadows across the various shapes of the foliage as I continued to concentrate on the vine and observe and record its movements. The air was thick with the smell of damp soil and exotic blooms, and that aroma combined with the earlier adrenaline and the utter insanity of this whole situation gave me a sensation of intense invigoration like I had never before experienced. I'd been examining the vine, questioning my assumptions, when I came to a disquieting realization. The vine, if that was really all it was, seemed to exhibit some sort of consciousness and adaptivity of which I was unfamiliar. The winding tendrils were almost purposefully slithering out and towards the greenhouse doors. To what end? Escape. 
I found myself pacing the length of the greenhouse, my unease growing, even as my excitement grew with this revelation. The differentiation between plant and sentient being had blurred somehow, and my thoughts turned to the ethics of what my Uncle Silas had been doing here. The words of Dr. Evelyn Thorne and my brother Liam concerning the dangers of the greenhouse now took on added weight. The more I read through my uncle's notes and journals, the more unsettled I became. His writings and experiments were those of an extremely intelligent, if somewhat obsessed, scientist who felt no restraint in his pursuit of advancement. I thought back to my time studying the vine, using the microscope for hours on end, oblivious to anything but my research. But now, with greater understanding of the vine and its potential, could I in good conscience continue? The greenhouse took on an unsettling feeling as I grappled with all I had learned. The vine felt like it was watching me from the trellises and, in some odd way, beckoned me and warned me away at the same time. I considered how my fixation had been impacting my daily life, my unkempt nature, the messiness of my work areas, and how I'd grown more and more withdrawn from people in my life. The sun was setting, and the dimming light within the greenhouse set me pondering the ramifications of what I was doing. The sound of the equipment had taken on an edge of warning rather than comforting hum, but it was too late to turn back now. I had nearly reached my answers, my goal. Turning back to the vine, I was afraid, but I had to know. The greenhouse had secrets, and I was ready to learn them, to understand them, regardless of the consequences. I straightened up as I realized that I had opened Pandora's box. The thick tendrils of the vegetation were still extending outward, and I realized the grave power that I now held and what the revelations to come would be. I knew that I had just endangered myself and put myself at the mercy of... something. Still, I could not turn away. The mystery that had consumed my uncle's attention for so long demanded that I continue. I moved away from the vine further into the dim greenhouse, back to the workbench. The first light of day filtered through the now open window, and I sat stooped over the workbench, looking from the pages to the vine. My hair was unkempt, and my clothes disheveled from the countless sleepless nights I'd spent trying to decipher my Uncle Silas's research. I wrote as fast as I could, trying to document my observations and theories of the plant. It felt like it was growing very subtly from the corner of the room, escaping from the pot, and I started to feel like it was planting thoughts in my mind, if that even makes any sense. It was almost like it was influencing my perceptions, playing tricks with my reality, with my sanity. I opened the greenhouse door and frowned, wondering if I was drooling. Dr. Evelyn Thorne and Liam were standing in the doorway, trying in calming tones to get me to move back from the workbench and its vines. Please, Evelyn pleaded. Avery, you need to step back from this. It's not healthy. Fear and frustration welled within me, and my voice grew louder. I can't. It's here. I can feel it. I need to go on. Liam frowned and was trying to plead with me. Avery, man, look at yourself. You are going out of your mind with this. Let us help you. I didn't budge and the insistence in their pleading gained a fevered pitch until I saw the vines quivering and straining towards us with my eyes. I fought to keep from losing it, my mind reeling under the weight of my exhaustion and paranoid fears. That thing with the vine, it was something more than just a plant. It was driving me to madness. I wouldn't listen to Evelyn and Liam. I let them go, told them to come back and help me get out of here and get over this obsession. When the greenhouse door closed behind me and I was left alone with the vine, a sense of wrongness hung in the air. Those sinuous tendrils shifted lazily in the low, early morning sun. I wondered if this was a cost of that knowledge. Still, with fear gripping me, I couldn't turn tail and leave. I needed to know what my uncle had been so consumed by. I ignored the knot of building terror in my gut and took another long breath moving back to the workbench and examining the vine further. My concentration returned to my research, and the greenhouse seemed to shrink, my fixation becoming a weight. The vine continued to be present, always there beside me now, 
buzzing with energy that drew me to it and warned me to stay away at the same time. Assessed. With every passing second, I felt myself losing more of myself, of my identity to it. But still, as the shadows lengthened and the greenhouse darkened, I could not allow myself to stop until I had my answers, whatever the cost to my sanity. I sat bolt upright in the bed, gasping and drenched in sweat, my heart racing. The darkened living quarters seemed too small and the air too thick, and I turned my gaze to the open doorway leading to the greenhouse and the ambient glow from beneath it. I forced myself to rise from the bed and shuffled over to the door, raising a trembling hand to the handle where it met the cooler metal of the door. When it swung open, I nearly fell backwards in surprise. Once it had passed through the greenhouse doors, the vine had long ago overtaken the doors and was now crawling along the floor, reaching the living spaces. The light from the bioluminescence created an odd illumination, shadows flickering and contorting in the unnerving light. I felt a rising panic as I went over to the workbench, desperately looking for something to cut the plant. My hands took up a pair of pruning shears shakily, and I felt their cold weight in my grip as I began to hack at the vine, movements frantic. Each time I slashed away a portion of it, the vine would recoil and then press forward again, as if taking strength from some unseen source. I could feel the heavy aroma of sap and greenery rising to nearly fog my consciousness as more and more leaves rustled around me. I understood then that the vine was far too extended for anything else. The heavy weight of my isolation pressed down on me, the overwhelming helplessness of not having Evelyn and Liam here filling the void. With a desperate finality, I made my decision. I used the shaking keys to relock the doors to the greenhouse and then began pushing a couple pieces of furniture and some of the equipment up against it. I could hear the scrape of the metal on the concrete floor as it moved, and I thought of the barrier that now existed between me and the exterior. I ran for the communications equipment, ripping the internet link and severing the phone lines. Then it was quiet, like it was smothering me. I slumped to the sealed door, gasping for breath and fear, understanding the severity of the situation at last. The vine was somehow escaping the greenhouse and expanding, the energy flowing through it like some kind of heartbeat pulsing the length of its tendrils throughout the facility. I stood alone, unaided, before the results of my curiosity, the results of the growth of this alien vine. The room was dark, the sickly illumination of the plant stretching across the room from the open balcony behind me. My thoughts began to drift to refer to the real and crushing need to know and understand the secret of the vine and the impossible insanity of what it truly was. The greenhouse was a nightmare now. The vine was always around me, pulsing with energy, drawing me to it and pushing me away, promising me the revelations to come. I sat there, feeling very much alone at that moment, and almost thought I felt the vines tingling and stretching towards me as if beckoning me in some way. I found that with time, I was taking on the characteristics of the vine and was no longer sure where I ended and it began. I didn't care. I wasn't going to stop until I found out what had happened, even if it drove me mad. After several weeks, the entirety of the greenhouse looked like a madman's verdant maze. The whole of it was filled with pulsing, sinewy vegetation, and I, everywhere I went, I pushed my way through the tangled foliage with frenetic energy. My face and hair were wild, signs of too many nights without sleep as I pored over the plant's growth. I reached out with one of the leaves, my hands cut and shaking from tending to the vine, and the reflected light basked my grimy face, highlighting the dark circles under my eyes and the six-day stubble growth. The lights dimmed and brightened again, sending shadows dancing around the workbench as I studied the pages of the journal left to me by my uncle. The papers were yellowed and age-stained and covered in intricate diagrams and formulas. I strained to make sense of the notation, hoping to find some key which would unlock the mystery of the vine. Then I saw that more of the vine was growing, and the tendril had many pulsating pods along its length, casting a dim illumination. They looked, 
feeling them to be smooth and somehow very slightly placated if such a thing could be. I didn't even register the sound from outside the greenhouse. If anything, I had seen my friends, family, Evelyn and Liam out at the edge of the property already, looking on and with heightened concern from all the calls and emails I hadn't responded to. I was aware of the muffled sounds of the men outside the greenhouse trying to get in, but it barely registered either, and seemed far off and of little consequence to the amazing immensity of the plant unfurling before me. In the greenhouse, I paid no attention to anything but the vine, and over the moments, it became more and more difficult to differentiate where I began and it ended, and the tendrils around me. I started to see the vine as something more than a plant, as something that had been built upon Uncle Silas's work and my own. The hints and ideas left in the greenhouse indicated that the plant was somehow conscious, could communicate somehow. I had pushed further into the discovery, willing to risk everything. The more I labored over this work, the more I began to doubt myself. The more I felt the loneliness of my isolation, the more I convinced myself that I had released something I had no control over. The tendrils of the plant seemed to encroach on my thoughts, demonstrating its strength and explaining to me the threat I was under. But I had to know. I had to find out. There was something in me that needed to understand what had driven my uncle to this vine, and I moved back to the bench. I kept my head down and my focus on my research, and the greenhouse grew more confined, more paranoid. The vine throbbed at my side, keeping fresh in my mind the horrifying truths I faced. With each passing moment, I felt myself losing my grip, unable to distinguish the reality from the hallucinations. But I knew I would not be able to sleep until I got to the bottom of it, regardless of how it affected my sanity. I lay panting in the grass, watching as the greenhouse burned before me. The heat was intense and the roar of the flames and breaking glass was deafening. Smoke billowed upwards from the blazing structure, obscuring the starlit sky and throwing an orange hue across the grounds around me. The disarray of my appearance spoke to my single-minded obsession. My grubby, sweat-stained clothes clung to my weary frame, and my once neat hair was matted and tangled. Dark circles from my many sleepless nights spent poring over Uncle Silas's notes and tending to the plant, piled into drifts beside me. As I stood there and watched the greenhouse in front of me incinerate, I understood the truth of it. The vine had grown beyond an interesting experiment and something of a pride point into something too strong, too wild, too dangerous. It had all but consumed every inch of its surroundings and was on the verge of outgrowing and overrunning the entire facility. After a moment's thought, I couldn't say whether I should expose the vine's awareness or eradicate it. Instead, I gathered up all of Uncle Silas's notes, the journals, and anything flammable. I doused the vines and samples with the accelerants, their sharp chemical smell mixing with the raw green odor of plant. I looked over the area my uncle and I had spent the last two months working on and raised a trembling hand holding a match. A moment later, the match was falling from my hand, thrown, and I watched as the flames quickly raced away, spreading across the vines and plants. It was too hot, and I needed to get out of the greenhouse. Coughing on the thick smoke, I tripped over my own feet, falling out of the door and onto the cool grass of the outside. The flashing lights and blaring sirens of the authorities that surrounded me seemed to be growing more and more muffled as I laid there, staring at the flames. I thought about my sacrifice, about how it had all been for nothing, and how my research and my foolish pride in the vine's growth were nothing but smoldering ruins. I'd alienated my friends and family and put aside their worries in my single-minded quest. Now, as I lay prostrate on the grass, I was beginning to feel the result. I sagged against a nearby green metal file cabinet, and my eyes slid shut as the greenhouse only moments before beyond the rusting cabinet rattling like rain. I could hear the muted sounds of the approaching authorities, and the shouts grew and more of them streamed through the open gates. I could hear them shouting to each other, asking about injured personnel and need for medical aid. I thought of the burning greenhouse as I lapsed into unconsciousness. 
The maze of twisted greenery was now a charred wasteland, and the vine was nothing more than a memory of my uncle's brilliance and my own efforts. I had given everything I had for the knowledge of the vine, friends, family, my own sanity, years and years of research and obsession. As the world started to go dim, I wondered if it had been worth it, or if I'd lost my mind ages ago, in the first days of my exile here. The sun was just beginning to light the white painted walls of the hospital room through the slats of the window's blinds, and I was still laying there in bed, dressed in bandages and heavily sedated. The beep-chirp, beep-chirp of the heart monitor and the muffled sounds of nurse and doctor footsteps and voices lent the room an entirely unwelcome vibrancy after the silence of the greenhouse. I tried to focus, and my eyes found the light when the door to the room opened. Dr. Evelyn Thorne appeared at my bedside, a look of concern upon her aged face, and rested a hand on my arm in a comforting manner an expression of pain evident on my face as I tried to comprehend. Avery, she said gently with relief, you are awake. How are you feeling? I wanted to speak, but my throat was so raw and filled with smoke from the fire that I could hardly manage a croak. Instead, I just nodded weakly, turning my gaze up at her, pleading for an answer in my face. Dr. Thorne must have been able to feel the questions forming in my mind. The greenhouse, she began slowly. It was destroyed. The fire department sifted through the remains, but found no sign of the vine or any of the other plants. Your offering, Avery, seems to have put a stop to the unnatural foliage. I squeezed my eyes shut as the emotions washed over me. Relief, grief, unease all at once. What had been the twisted vines with their pulsing pods and glowing tendrils that accompanied me were no more. I'd reduce them to ashes in my desperate act. I opened my eyes at the sound of footfalls, and Liam, my older brother, entered the room, his face a mixture of relief and concern as he approached and surveyed my wounds. Avery, he said with some emotion in his voice, I am glad that you still live, but you took such risks. Those experiments, that madness, it nearly destroyed you. I could hear the frustration and anger in his voice, but I also understood that he was speaking out of love and concern. I nearly tried to explain about the vine, the draw to it, its mysteries, but my mind was still foggy. Dr. Thorne and Liam were discussing something about the fire, and then their voices grew dim in my ears, my thoughts drifting back to the greenhouse and my work what I had been doing. An investigation was being started, but I didn't think we'd ever know much more than that about Uncle Silas's experiments. I don't know. As I lay there, bruised and battered and with the events involving the vine fresh in my unsettled mind, I don't know. I mean, the doctors had all said that the greenhouse fire had certainly put an end to it and had assured me in no uncertain terms that there had been nothing to worry about but I still had this nag in the back of my mind. A little piece of it, perhaps a shard of the original vine had somehow managed to escape, and the fire in the greenhouse hadn't killed it properly. It had managed to root elsewhere somehow, and it lived. I felt the weight of exhaustion upon me, and my eyelids grew heavy. I dreamed fitfully of the burning greenhouse and wondered about my uncle's work. I understood that it was going to take years and years to recover from my affliction. That was how deeply my obsession had damaged me. As I lay in that hospital bed and listened to the rhythmic beeping of the heart monitor, it suddenly struck me that I needed to learn what I could about the vine. The sun was just beginning to filter through the window and brighten the white painted walls of my hospital room, and I knew that my journey was not at an end. The greenhouse wasn't there anymore, but the doubts and the obsession it had stirred would remain. In my mind's eye, the doubts of the vine's continued existence gnawed, tantalizingly, at the back of my consciousness.